fuck am I watching right now? Hello, welcome back to the Guys Podcast. I'm Lauren. And I'm Michael. How's everybody doing? We went back to the well of suggested cases from Patreon, from our Just a Banter podcast over there. We asked everyone right. what's a case that we should just cover already. And Jacob Wetterling <laughs> came up at least once, and it's been yeah. on my list forever. It's one of those cases that I, I've I've heard years ago and never stopped thinking about because of the way that the crime went down. It's one of the right. most tragic and sad cases. It just really sticks in my head. It's one of those that affected me uh, because Absolutely, of the crime man. and the details I- of it. It was just so unnecessary and sad, and he seemed like just like, you know, this kid knew what was going to happen. And it's just so it's crazy to think that an 11 year old had to face that, you know, situation knowing that he was about Absolutely. to die at the hands of this monster. So, right. And, that, you know, in the past, we've tend to shy away from cases, you know, especially involving child murder and whatnot. We have covered we have covered a few. Um, but I didn't realize that this case was like, you know, so sentimental to you. Yeah, I figured we would have covered it. You know, I just figured we were shying away from it just for the the child aspect of it. So, but uh, we do want to give a warning before yeah. this. Obviously, there is violence towards children in this episode, sexual assault and so, murder of a child. So, and I mean, sure, he's eleven. Yeah. Definitely falls into the child category. Um, absolutely. That absolutely. being said, it's uh, you know, it's an interesting story. The way that this guy got caught, it went on for a long time. It was unsolved. Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize until diving deeper into this case how they had this guy all along right under their nose. I mean, they had interviewed him multiple times right at the jump, right after Jake right. Wetterling's uh, abduction. And, you know, he, they just didn't have enough, unfortunately. And then he goes on to live out his life for the next, like, 25 years without getting caught. So Yeah, committing more of these atrocities. Mm. So, yeah. yeah. All right, well, let's dive into it. Jacob Wetterling, you guys asked for it. You're going to get it. I've been wanting to cover this one forever. It's just time to do it. So let's dive into it. Here we go. Today, October 12th, I'm five feet tall. My whole name is Jacob Irvin Wetterling. My favorite food is steak. My favorite color is blue. My best friend is Aaron Larson. My favorite, I don't really have a favorite song. My favorite game is Clue. My favorite thing to do most is watch football. My favorite sport is football. And my favorite TV show is The Cosby Show. My, what I want to be when I grow up is a football player. My favorite hobby is collecting football cards. I don't have a favorite book. And All right, this week we're finally covering Jacob Wetterling. Uh, it's one of the more infamous true crime cases um, and tragic, and we've, we've prefaced it all enough. Let's just dive into it. So Jacob Wetterling was born on February 17th, 1978, and shares a birthday with Michael Jordan, the GOAT, Paris Hilton, oh, wow. that's hot, Ed Sheeran. That's hot. <laughs> That's hot. Mm-hmm. Ed Sheeran, uh, who's not hot. Sheeran, and then okay. Taylor Hawkins, rest in peace. <laughs> one of the greatest drummers ever. Ed Sheeran, though. What Good a for him, because, man, he's hard to look at, you know. I know, but what a self-made story. <laughs> you know, he couldn't sing either. You really? know, he taught himself to sing, too. He couldn't sing, and he was ugly. And now look at him. <laughs> so what's your excuse, people? What is your excuse? Seriously. That's all I got to say. Huh. Oh my Ed God. Sheeran, man, out here against all odds. Right. <laughs> I know that there's plenty of people that think he's hot, but I truly just think that that's because he's Ed Sheeran. You know, it's, it's like if, you, if this dude was just some random fucking kid in your school, yeah, you wouldn't think he's hot. Oh man, no, that ginger would have a hard time. Yeah, uh, and then Taylor <laughs> Hawkins, uh, the great drummer for the oh, Foo Fighters and yes. other bands, and uh, Rest just recently passed yeah. away. And did you see the video of his son uh, drumming at the I latest did. Foo Fighters? Holy shit, man, that'll. It was hard to miss it. Dude, that that kid's passionate, that's right? He's got his that dad's drive for sure. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Badass yeah. drummer too. Why don't they just why don't they smile. just add him to the band, man? Like I know. <laughs> like he who wouldn't who would not be happy with that? Because obviously he's capable of drumming anything. So Right? Yeah, he's amazing. He's amazing. Imagine what he's learned from Dave Grohl too over the years. Like, mm-hmm. man, 
just being like around mentorship this just kid being around all that yeah that yeah. spotlight's not too big for him he's already been around it so long yep it's normal yeah so jacob wetterling was born in saint joseph saint joseph minnesota a uh, quiet town two hours north of minnesota it's a farming town you know like a uh, middle america small town type of vibes dirt yeah. roads and you know not much there right right um at the time in the 80s the police chief didn't even carry a gun so that tells you how little crime wow, there was that is small town small town everyone i imagine just left their doors unlocked and that type of that type of vibe right well kids were allowed to walk around by themselves no big deal apparently yeah well in october of 1989 uh on october 22nd um young jacob weatherling who was it was 11 year 11 years old at the time um had a an awesome sunday they had the next day off from school probably like a staff development day or something like that and right. it was a sunday it was football season they watched the vikings play they watched i think they watched the minnesota wild like a hockey game and all of that he was hanging out with his 10 year old brother trevor so his younger brother and their 11 year old friend aaron larson as well and aaron was spending the night so it was a sleepover because they didn't have school on monday um and just right. i think they ate pizza like they just had a whole fun day and it was going to continue on through the night um and jacob's father was a chiropractor and head of a local chapter of the N naacp his mother patty wetterling uh was, i think was a stay-at-home mom and on this evening uh after this fun filled day um jacob's parents jerry and patty were going to a dinner date so they were having a, a fun night planned as well um, and as I mentioned, that was on the night of October 22nd, 1989. Um, and this dinner party was 30 minutes away from the house. Of course, this is 1989. So there's no cell phones. Um, there's no internet. And right. so they, they basically had a landline and they would leave very typical of the, of the time. They would leave a note with a phone number on it. This is where we're going to be. Um, this is where you can reach us. This is right. where you can reach us. Call this number if, if anything happens or if anything changes or whatever. And basically like a list of rules, of course, like probably number one is don't leave the house. Um, right. Don't answer the door to any strangers, things like that. Um, they also had a younger sister, eight year old Carmen as well, who was at the home. Um, okay. And so, yeah, they were supposed to stay in the house and and basically no babysitter. I mean, just the, the two 11 year olds watching over the younger brother and younger sister. That was very typical right. of the time. Um, yeah, that's not really that crazy. Even now, depending on your depending on your child, go away for thirty minutes or so. You know, yeah, they can handle it. Right, they can handle it. it's good for them. However, uh, while they were at the dinner party, the kids at the house got their own ideas. You know how 10, 11 year olds yes. they can they start hatching plans. They decided they right. they wanted to rent a movie. You know, this is the the days of the the rentals, you know, Blockbuster. Yes, I don't think they hit up Blockbuster. I don't think they even had a Blockbuster <laughs> in this small town. They had a Tom Thumb grocery store, which had a, a like a rental section in it, which I even remember like right. Albertsons and stuff back in the nineties having yeah. having little uh, VHS rental sections. Yes, we could rent them for yeah, like we don't have Albertsons here on the, the East night. Coast, but I I do remember movies being in grocery stores. We had a chain here called Ingles, okay. and yeah, they would always have like a book section and also a movie section where you can mm -hmm. rent. Maybe some video games and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I used to love doing that, man. Yeah, so the, the boys decided they wanted to ride their bikes down to the Tom Thumb grocery store, which was only like, I think, like a half a mile away on a straight shot, straight down the paved road to the grocery store. Right, they probably probably went there all the time. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, so Trevor, the I think Trevor was the 10-year-old the younger brother, calls the, the number that the parents had left for them and asks – First, his mother, they talked to the mom first, Patty, and um, if they could take a ride down there. It's getting, it's dark at this point, and Patty says no. She doesn't think it's a good idea. They then mm -hmm. asked to speak to the father. They pulled this routine, which doesn't fly in my house, but no, it works, no, this it works for some kids, I suppose. Strongly discouraged in my house as well. Right. I think this, this actually probably would have worked in my house growing up. <laughs> I, I think I could have pulled yeah. off the let me talk to dad thing, and he was more lenient. Especially right, with right. this sort of stuff. My mom let me do what I want in the house, but like when it came to like leaving and doing things, she didn't like taking those risks. But, right. But my dad, yeah. you know, fathers usually assume that the worst isn't going to happen. Mothers do. Um, so right, right. Trevor asks his father, Jerry, uh, if he could take this ride down that the mother had already said no to. And the father unfortunately says yes. And of course you can't blame the father. Mm. He, he no, didn't know how this was going to turn out, but God, I could only imagine being him and knowing how this turned out and just wishing you could go back in time and just say no, you know? 
Oh, I know. And then imagine mm. being the mother yeah. and trying not to harbor any resentment towards your husband for the rest of your life. Like, yeah. I do believe oh. they stayed together too, which is pretty incredible. Well, they had other children. Yeah. So that, yeah, yeah but usually when a, a couple loses a child like this in this tragic manner, they don't stay together, especially like uh, this scenario mm. where I could, you could totally see the wife blaming the husband, you know? Yeah. I'm sure there were some things said out of anger that she didn't mean and whatnot. Yeah. Like that could just... Yeah. That's a heartbreaking situation. So the boys even arranged for the neighbor girl, 14-year-old Rochelle, to come over and babysit their little sister, Carmen, who was eight years old, while they rode their bikes to the store. So they didn't take their little sister with them. Um, yeah. this was a, responsible. Yeah. This was a country road. It was paved. Uh, there was no street lights, And they wore bright clothing and wore fl- flashlights. So very, uh, imagine, stranger things. Like that's the vibe I yeah. get. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 80s music, absolutely. Bright clothes. They everything they got, was bright clothes, regardless. So because it was the 80s. Yeah, they got they got their little baskets on the front. Right. <laughs> Booking it down the road. Yeah. So they make it to the store, no problem, and they go on to rent uh, a VHS of the Naked Gun, the comedy the flick. Naked Gun. Yes. Yeah. I remember vaguely. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that was a little bit before my time. I never really appreciated those silly comedies. Of the 80s. Yeah, it's the guy from Mr. Magoo, right? Yeah, I think so. Oh, what's his name? I can't think yeah. of his name right now. Me neither. So people are probably screaming at me. Oh, well. Right. The Naked Gun guy. Everybody knows who it is. Yeah. <laughs> so they get the, the VHS, and they're on their way back down the road. They came uh, down to go to the store at about 9.15 p.m., and suddenly there's a man standing in the road blocking their path. He's dressed in all black and wearing a mask over his face and also holding a handgun. And Oh, shit. Yeah. He tells the boys to stop and orders Trevor to turn off the flashlight that he's holding. He then has, has the boys push their bikes and a scooter. So there was two bikes and a scooter and he has them push them into the roadside ditch and orders them to lie face down in the ditch. I've actually looked at the Google street view. You can pull up the map it, right on the Wikipedia page. It shows the road where this went down, like on the right, on the right side yeah. on a map and you can go on street view and, and it's just kind of eerie going on that road. Cause you can, basically imagine which ditch it was like i'm not sure which side of the road but either way you get a feel for at nighttime how just how desolate that stretch of road is i mean obviously it's a main thoroughfare for the people that live back in there so this guy's taking a chance that the parents don't come home from the dinner party early and see this situation going down he would have been busted in the act but but there's no lights there's no street lights out there whatsoever and then there's also and then there's also tall grass in the fields. So, mm-hmm. you know, like if you needed to hide really quickly, it would That's be why his first, easy. That's why his first mode of action was to get the, their stuff off the road so that if someone did start coming down the road, they could then also jump into this ditch and not be seen. Right, right. Their uh, bikes wouldn't be sitting on the side of the road for someone to see whatnot. Yeah, so he has This guy them, was experienced. Oh, yes. We find out he had done this many times prior um, to this mm-hmm. occasion. So he orders them to lie face down in the ditch and asks them each of their ages. He tells Trevor to get up and run to the woods and not look back. So Trevor is the 10 year old. So he, he's, I guess, looking for a slightly older. And we would find this out later too, that most of his victims prior to this were in the 12 to like 16 range. So he apparently, you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, leans towards more adolescent teen age, 12 to 16. Um, So he has Trevor run towards the woods and not look back or else he'll shoot him, he says. He then sits the other two boys up and looks at their faces. He grabs Aaron's crotch and then tells him to run to the woods. And then he basically chooses Jacob based off of whatever, Mm -hmm. for whatever reason, the way he looks or whatever it is. Um, The man then drags Jacob away by his arm and the other boys ran to the house. Absolutely terrifying situation for them, I'm sure. Um, they leave their bikes there and just run back to the home. Um, and back at the Wetterling home, the boys tell the babysitter Rochelle what happened, who she then calls her father or tells her father who calls 911. The father then calls Jerry and Patty off the number that they had left and informs them of what happened to which they immediately leave the dinner party, of course, and head home. The, uh, Stearns County Sheriff's department answers the call and immediately responds. I mean, obviously there's not a lot going on in this small town, so. They, they jump at the, uh, the, the telling of this, this crazy situation and, and make their way out to the farm area where this abduction had happened. Um, right. they, they're on that road. They find the boys' bikes and the scooter in the ditch, but no sign of Jacob. 
and it's dark at this point. So they searched the field and woods for a bit, but decided to call off the search at about 3 a.m. when they're worried at this point about trampling through evidence and stuff. They can't see anything. They're dealing with flashlights and you're more likely to screw something up, you know, in the darkness when you only have right. to wait a few hours until morning. So at 8 a.m., they they hit the search again hard with bloodhounds and the dogs would lead the police to a gravel road just off the paved road where Jacob was taken. And there they see shoe tracks, tire tracks, and it, it's, it becomes apparent to them that a vehicle was used in this abduction. And that's why, you know, Jacob was long gone by the time they got there. Right. Um, and it turns out that this abduction occurred unfortunately for one of one individual at the base of a quarter mile long driveway which led to the home of a family called the raciers raciers and yeah, at the time poor family man wrong well, place wrong time yeah no doubt this guy <laughs> dan rassier who's a 34 year old music teacher at the time in 1989 was the only one at the family farm at the time at the rassier farm and this abduction happened right at the base of his quarter mile long uh oh no dirt driveway so his family was on an extended european vacation and the rassier farm um they had been owned by the family since 1931 and their son uh you know a different type of guy like he was a 34 year old still living at home at the time in 1989 that was not very common he was abandoned right. music teacher who collected records traveled and raised cows and chickens in a in relative uh anonymity and became an early I early see, target i see what you're saying he was, because of his alternative lifestyle. I didn't realize all that stuff about him. I just thought yeah. he was a suspect because of the location, but I didn't realize he was single and then, you know, no mm -hmm. family at 34, still living yep. at home. But it is a farm, though, right? It is an yeah. operation. His parents probably need help by this point. I, 100%. I do feel like it, in in rural communities, I could see how children will stay, certain children will stay with their family to help yeah. out with the farm well into their thirties, forties, and maybe just never leave their family farm and just take it over when their yeah. parents perish. You know, like, I think that's more common because where are you going to go? You're yeah. going to go buy another farm adjacent to that. Like, why not just stay on the farm? Right. Yeah. Why not invest in the farm you're already a part of that you grew up on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and in these small communities, it's probably well. harder to find a mate as well. You know, there's, there's less fish to choose Absolutely. from. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the night of the abduction, when police first began searching at around 1030 PM, Dan awoke, they were searching around his property around the Rassier farm around 1030 PM. And Dan awoke to his dog barking and saw people moving about his property with flashlights. And apparently he thought they were like trying to steal firewood or something. Um, but there was multiple right. people. And so rather than going out there and getting into a confrontation, he would call 911 and inform, be informed of the abduction <laughs> that had taken place at the end of his driveway. He then walked outside and had a brief yeah. conversation with police and even offered to help look around his parents' property for the boy. Um, however, that night, he neglected to tell police that he had seen a car pull in and turn around in his driveway earlier that night. Um, he instead tells them the next day, which in their eyes seem, makes him he, seem guilty. Like, why didn't you tell us this the night before? But Right. To, he probably just wasn't thinking about it. And that to his defense, I think the deputies that he talked to when he first came out that night were just, they were just deputies that, they didn't really care about him. They didn't think of him as a suspect right away. They were just looking around in the dark for a boy. Okay. You know, and they also didn't probably realize how serious it was at the time. They might have just thought the kid got lost or who knows what was going so on. So you think after they met him, he became a suspect? Yeah. Well, I think the heads of the You're investigation saying... started looking at the situation where it's like, you got this, who's this guy on this farm? He's 34 yeah. years old, still lives in his parents' who's farm. And they, you know, yeah. they determined that the abduction, the tire prints and all that stuff, like the, the foot tracks all that stuff was right at the base of his driveway right but yeah. none of it was tied to him though they it's had like, nothing, don't yeah. you think if he used his car it would still be here right most likely well or there would be some car registered to him that would fit those that style of tire well soon soon police would get new information that would lead them to believe that there was not a car involved and we'll get oh. to that and then that just turned their right. sights on dan even more because it's like well it's just a why would he need a car? He's he's basically a day's happened in his driveway. So yeah. Oh, so yeah. they turn it on him again. Yeah. Because it's like, yeah, well, if there wasn't a car and car used, how could someone have gotten way out here on foot and taken this kid away before we could see them? You know, like it, it had to have been this guy whose yeah. farms right here. Oh shit. And then he comes to them saying, Oh wait, I did see a car. Yes, and then exactly. they're like, Oh the next day. yeah, I'm yeah. sure of you, did. you did. Okay. Okay. I, I'm seeing how this is all layering. Mm -hmm. But still, though, it's still all bullshit. It's still wrong place, wrong time. <laughs> Poor yeah. guy. 
So he soon faced oh, news cameras, threats, a lie detector test, hypnosis, and multiple searches of his family farm over the course of the next 20 hypnosis? years. Basically, it would, they would keep coming Is back Is that legal? Him. Sure, if you agree to it. Yep. Yeah, he he was very forthright, forthcoming. Like, he was willing to help the yeah, investigation in any means. Now, he didn't even hire a lawyer. But, man, hypnosis. I'd be scared they'd make me admit to something I didn't do. <laughs> right. That shit really does like, seem to nah. work on some people, man. Like, yeah. Who knows? You are guilty. You're right, I am. Right. <laughs> okay, I guess I'm guilty. Yeah. Right. Start planting memories in someone's head. Man. Right. Creepy. So over the coming months, the police and the Wetterling family would use local news to appeal to the public for help finding Jacob, finding whoever took him. Tips would flood into the community, and people would say that they had seen Jacob at different locations with strange men. This is a time with very little entertainment. You know, like people probably had like three channels on their television. One of them was the news and in a small Especially community, in everybody wanted town. to get involved in this shit. Everybody wanted to try and help or just entertain themselves by getting involved. And so right. unfortunately for the Wetterlings, they had this special hotline tip phone installed at their home and it would just get called in all hours of the night. And, and of course, Patty's answering that phone um, as well as the father. And they're getting no sleep anyway, I'm sure, wondering where their boy is. And so they're more than right. willing to answer the phone at two in the morning. But more often than not, it's these eccentric weirdo fucking psychics that would call them and offer up theories about what they had dreamed had happened to Jacob. And this is where I think he is. And this is what happened to him and yada, yada. And all of it was based off nothing, just some fucking dream they Jesus. had or whatever. And they're really doing more damage than good. Absolutely. And perhaps none, none of these, uh, psychics that were calling the Wetterling family was, was more strange than Vernon seats, a psychic and barber that drove long distances on several occasions to meet with the Wetterlings. He even brought them a painting of Jacob on one occasion. And we'll talk more He's about Vernon Seats. And a barber. Yeah, we'll talk about, I know, right? What a combo. <laughs> you know, I can tell you your future and, and also give you a trim. Uh, it's two for one. Right. Or maybe he tells your future by looking at your hair, <laughs> maybe. by your scalp. Yeah, but I can yeah, change your future like, by giving you a nice uh, trim there, bud. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we'll, we'll talk more about Vernon That's Seats weird. later. This fucking creep comes up again later on. Yeah. He's Definitely a, something weird about this dude. Yeah. You could say that. Wait till we get to what they found in his apartment later on. Yeah. So indeed, the police would follow up on every lead that came their way. Uh, but all of these leads ended up hitting dead ends and the case remained cold. They did, however, interview uh, a suspect early on. And we'll talk about later that ended up being that ended up being the killer. Uh, but they just they had a hunch he had been doing uh, uh, other crimes, uh, you know, sexual assaults to boys around that age at the time. Right. And they just didn't have anything connecting him to the Wetterling case aside from like the fact that he was doing the same type of crimes in the area. And unfortunately, it was early in uh, in the days of DNA and all that stuff. They did collect his DNA. But we'll get to all that. OK. In 2003. So this this case went cold. Basically, they interviewed people. They had some promising leads, but they just couldn't put the pieces together to arrest anyone for the crime. But in 2003, 14 years after the fact, a man came forward that said that on the night of Jacob's abduction, he had been listening to his police scanner when the call came in. He said that he drove out to the scene and had seen the bikes and scooters in the ditch and had even talked to police briefly. And this is what I was alluding to earlier, where they then rule a car out as being involved in the crime, and then they turn their sights back to poor Dan Rassier. So oh, with this okay. new information in 2003... They changed the way they viewed the police changed the way that they viewed this abduction. They now had an explanation for that car that was believed to be at the scene that supposedly Dan had seen out his window. And also they had these tire tracks, you know, on that driveway. And so this is right. an explanation for that. This it was just this guy that came out that was curious and had a, one of those police scanner people that want to, you know, just want to know everything that's going on. Yeah. Just and interjecting would, himself in the investigation. A lot of police scanners in this case, though, because it would turn out that the the killer in this uh case was that was his uh one of his weapons that he chose was a police yeah. scanner that was something that he used to get away with a lot of crimes he had one in his car Dude. and you know when he would go around abducting and assaulting boys he was always listening to the police scanner dude police scanners were the shit in like the late 90s early 2000s so i i feel like i, feel I don't like feel my, like they my should dad be... had them in his cars and I had like a radar detector. Remember when radar detectors were a thing? You oh put, yeah! You like my dad stick always them on had the front, of those, bottom in his of visor. Window. Yeah, he had one in the visor. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. Those were harmless, you know. But yeah. <laughs> police scanners, I feel like, should be outlawed. Yeah. Like it's just like 
why would you give a criminal that advantage? You know, what, what good is it for the public mm -hmm. to be able to hear these transmissions going back and forth for law enforcement? Cause this guy was absolutely yeah. using it to his advantage. This killer. Oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And then you get these I mean, fuckers like this guy who come and obstruct in a, you, in an investigation. He's driving around adding new tracks and stuff to this shit for nothing, just because of his own curiosity. Dude, you know, you can like download police scanner apps on your phone. Though. Oh yeah. Done it before. And then for like That's one crazy. night, I'm like, oh, this is interesting. I'm like, I don't give a fuck. And I delete it. Yeah. <laughs> I don't need to know all this. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I get enough. I, I get enough bad news on a daily exactly. basis. There's enough doom scrolling going on, <laughs> on a daily basis. Seriously. So uh, if the abductor had fled with Jacob on foot, as they now assumed with having this explanation of that car that had been at the scene and it not being right. the, the abductor, then likely the abductor was on foot and likely a local and also likely close by. So once again, they turn their sights to the guy whose farm the abduction had taken place at the base of Dan Rassier. And, mm -hmm. and they just basically continue to harass this guy for most of his life, uh, from the time he was 34 until well into his like fifties in 2004. Um, th well, they, they basically began harassing him again, Dan Rassier, more on him in a, in a bit. They, they basically search his farm multiple times and bring him in for questioning while he's at school as a teacher. Like he's being taken out of his class and investigated by police. Like I think it's someone by one oh, point he might have gotten fired over this shit because they're like he's involved in a child's abduction and he's a teacher. You know, that's you just can't have that. Oh my god. So yeah, they're just really ruining this guy's life. I think he later I sued think about that. Uh, the police and he actually lost somehow, which I mean he Holy had a, shit. Sure, certainly had a case, right? I mean you fucking for like twenty years. <laughs> if anybody had a case. Right? You guys oh, tore god. apart my farm, you ruined my reputation, you may have costed me my job, all these different things. Yeah. You definitely costed him his reputation. I mean, and period. but at the same time, it's tough because I see why they were focused on him. I mean, you can see yeah. why, right? Not so much because of him, but it's because it happened it, it, right on his farm. He was alone. His parents were gone. Like, yeah. it, it just... No alibi. Yeah, and then when you rule out, like, a yeah. car being involved, which they were wrong about, by the way, but when they start assuming there was no car involved in the abduction, how did Jacob end up so far away so quickly on foot with this guy? So right, right, you can see why they were focused on him. But ultimately, at a certain point, when you've dug and dug and nothing's checking out, like you got to let it go. You got to drop it. Yeah, you, know? you have to admit your mistake. He, there. Like I and said, then... he'd been super forthcoming, didn't hire a lawyer. He was willing to submit DNA, anything they wanted. He he did. And it's like, dude, yeah. at what point, do, what do I have to do to get you to drop me from your suspect list here? Or at least like turn your sight somewhere very, else. At the very least, he deserves some type of, you know, financial retribution. Absolutely. For this. Something, yeah. something. If the guy had any like chance said, of getting, uh, you know, a, a partner, it was thwarted for another right. 20 years by these police just basically ruining his reputation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So in 2004, um, uh, a man named Jared, who was a, a uh, he came forward about a tale that it said that it happened to him when he was a teenager. He was, he lived in Cold Spring, Minnesota, 12 miles from St. Joseph, where uh, Jacob was abducted. Um, and this mm -hmm. in 2004, Jared comes forward and tells police about a situation that had happened to him that was eerily similar to how Jacob was abducted. Nine months before Jacob's abduction, when Jared was a boy, he was approached by a man in a car who stopped to ask him for directions. When Jared got closer, the man got out of the car with a gun and said, I have a gun and I'm not afraid to use it. Get in the vehicle. Jared said that inside the man's car was a police scanner. The man drove him to a remote location where he sexually assaulted him and then returned him later to Cold Spring. Um, and he said that the whole time that he was in this guy's custody, essentially, he uh, continually asked him, the man asked him whether he recognized him. And Jared wisely said no repeatedly. Um, after this event, this was reported to police. There was multiple of these types of situations going on in Cold Spring at the time prior to like in the year prior to Jacob's abduction, 30 miles away right. in Cold Spring, this was going on. And these were all reported and actually they were making local news like reporters were saying what's going on. There's a predator out here who's targeting teenage boys a lot of times on bicycles, very much like Wetter uh, Jacob Wetterling's situation. Um, right. Jared following this um, got tired of being in the area. His parents wanted him out of there as well. They moved away because Jared was actually getting picked on by other kids because he was getting taken out of class. And there was especially following Jacob Wetterling's. Um, abduction he continued mm -hmm. there was there was a lot of talk that there was a very similar thing that had happened to a boy in cold spring 
And of course, Jared, he keeps getting taken out of class and talking to police and stuff. Like everyone knew it was him. Right. And, and yeah, this guy's still out there. And this guy's still out there. So of course the parents want to get yeah. him the fuck out of there because we don't want this guy coming back for him again. Right. Especially but, the more heat that's on the investigation, you know, the more the more motive that killer has to finish yeah. him off. Yeah. Dude, yeah. But and now got in, out of there. Now in two thousand four, as an adult, he came forward hoping to get other victims to also come forward in order to catch this creep. Um, yeah, but to no and, avail. And people did, right? Yeah, I mean, Nobody people came, else forward. came forward. Well, people came forward and told their stories about what had happened to I was them. About to say, yeah. But it was always this man's wearing a mask. He approaches them a lot of times on a bike or on foot, and mm -hmm. he shows them a gun. Um, they said that he would wear a, a, like a homemade carpet mask, which is fucking terrifying. Like that is terrifying. something out of a horror movie, right? Like, ugh, ugh. wearing like a rug on his face. Yeah. Weird. Um, yeah, but that's creepy. Yeah, I mean, it basically just led to people to believe that Wetterling was probably taken by this guy, but who is it, you know? Yeah, exactly. They got no further. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Like, plenty of people came forward, but, you know, that this guy's a serial offender, so he knows what the hell he's doing. He's been doing it for a while for a reason. Yeah. Unfortunately. Decades later, in January of 2009, so just a handful of years after 2004, what we were just talking about with people coming forward, but... In 2009, authorities thought they finally found the man they were looking for. And it was the guy that we mentioned earlier, the creepy psych, uh, uh, psychic barber, psychic barber, Vernon Seats. <laughs> he, yeah. uh, shortly before he died, he'd been seeing a psychiatrist and told her some interesting things that he had killed two boys in 1958 when he himself was a teenager. Um, and she had been apparently kind of nudging him to go forward to police and tell them about this. Um, but shortly yeah. before he, he said he was going to do so. And then he died of natural causes at the age of 62 in January of 2009. Um, okay. So then the psychiatrist kind of breaks protocol and goes and tells police what he had told her. And right. this leads them to then um, go and search his, his home they searched his home and his businesses. Uh, they were thoroughly searched after his death, and police found many disturbing materials, including child pornography, bondage devices, books on cannibalism, which I actually have no issue with. A book on cannibalism it sounds fascinating. A book on torture, all of these things. I mean, it's that's well, child I mean, pornography when you pair though, that, is the most alarming thing. I will here. say, yes, when you pair it with the child porn and all the other things, then it's fucking creepy. But if you're just like, a normal right. home and you have a cannibalism book i got no issue with that i mean we're uh, true crime a podcast. Laminated, sure, we to judge he also had he also had a laminated poster of jacob wetterling though that's yeah that's weird. alarming he had that's newspaper clippings alarming. about missing children and a laminated poster like you said of jacob Wetter, wetterling he also had children's shoes mm -hmm. which he had no reason for because he didn't have any kids or grandkids yikes he had patches of human hair of various colors which is maybe oh, the Lord. worst of all that's um, probably the worst that's a that's a dead sign he was a serial killer Right. No doubt. That's just one of the saddest things that we, we notice uh, throughout studying all of this is that hurt people hurt people. It's cyclical nature of human behavior where if something's done to you as a child, you're very likely to then repeat that behavior later. Some people break the mold right. and do the opposite and you know fight for the people that get harmed by these type of situations. Um, but right. Yeah, we see it oftentimes, this type of thing, where a person is has something done to them as a child, and then they go on to do the exact same thing. Um, so apparently that was Vernon Seitz's deal, that he was abducted and assaulted as a child. And we come to find out that the killer in this case, which is not Vernon Seitz, by the way, spoiler alert, um, also was apparently uh, sexually assaulted as a child. And so it's just this horrible cycle of um, offenses that are going on here. Um, all these things were found in, in Vernon Seitz's uh, apartment. His wife came to his defense and said that he was assaulted and blah, blah, blah. Jacob's mother um, then confirmed that Seitz had come to visit her twice after Jacob's abduction, claiming to be a psychic and wishing to talk to her about her son. However, forensic analysis of Seitz's possessions found nothing to link him to Jacob Wetterling's disappearance. And so it was another dead end. They, you know, they found out this guy was an absolute disgusting creep and likely uh, child abuser as well. Um, right. But not not likely to be the guy that abducted Jacob Wetterling. Then in the summer isn't of 20... It, isn't it weird? Go ahead. Is it weird to say that maybe Seats, even though he was a child a child abuser himself, mm -hmm. maybe somehow had 
sympathy for Jacob because he saw that this happened to another kid and it reminded him of himself, like narcissistically. And so that's why he like genuinely did want to help in this situation. Maybe that was his way of, of trying to redeem himself, you know, later in life. Maybe that's why he got so involved in this investigation because it didn't seem like he had anything to do with Jacob until after he was killed. No. And he, of he all saw people, it pop up in the news. knew he didn't do it. Yeah, he, po- he, he saw it pop up in the news, and then he'd be, it, this was something that he identified with. He was, But I, I think it was more of a morbid curiosity and like obsession and sexual gratification for this creep. I mean, he had a bunch of child porn in his house and child shoes and stuff. Like, I don't yeah. yeah, I don't think he was trying to help more so just be more involved in it because it got him off yeah. or whatever the fuck. I was just, I'm just wondering. Yeah, I would no, think I, someone like him wouldn't want to be close to this at all because he does do these type of things. You see what I'm saying? Like just the fact that you got involved, it's like, mm-hmm. why did you do that? You just put the, you just Cross put the on yourself. On your back. Yeah. Yeah. It, it doesn't. So that's why I was thinking maybe he had a, a more important reason for involving himself in this. I was sitting here trying to figure it out. I don't know. Or maybe it's very much like sense. a Hannibal Lecter where I can get into the mind of the type of guy that would do this because I am the type of guy that would do this. Right. It's like it's like showing up where police are trying to figure out who painted like red graffiti everywhere with a red paint can being like, hey, can I help you guys? Right. Help you guys with anything? Mm -hmm. You need help? (laughs) Yeah. Me as someone who would do something just like this, I can help you guys figure out who did this. Yeah, it's very much (laughs) Hannibal Lecter-esque, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of creepy. Yeah. Um, So in the summer of 2010, police once again turned their sights on to Dan Rassier. Unfortunately, they began a very publicized search of the Rassier farm. No evidence of involvement in the abduction was found. I think they brought like excavators and all kinds of shit on the property. And Dan had been actually destroyed it kind of probably not helping himself because he had been apparently telling police that like he was genuinely concerned that he was going to be framed because they were so publicly for so many years uh, looking into him as a suspect and assuming that his farm had something to do with it, that he was concerned that the actual killer may have taken the body uh, to his farm and put it there during all of this. Like oh my move God. the body to his property. Imagine. And like that's actually oh my God. Not that far fetched. So he was telling police theories of like if they were gonna do this, I think they would do Dude. it over here. Because this farm he had that's... was huge and it had you know tons of like desolate areas. And so then they start Dude, searching. That's all these... a Sandu stories idea. <laughs> right. Right there. So absolutely. Oh my gosh. So then they start yeah, searching all to... these areas. That that to Andy. He had theorized that this killer may have put the body later on, but of course none of those panned out. Um man. Yeah. So they had to be so confused. <laughs> yeah. In May of 2014, more boys come forward uh, from another part of uh, another part of Minnesota, Painesville, near where Jacob, you know, not too far from where Jacob Wetterling was uh, taken. Right. And, and they began to talk again about uh, the Painesville assaults, which had occurred in the year prior to Jacob's abductions, uh, abduction, as many as 12 boys around the same age of 12 to 16 were assaulted in Painesville by a man wearing a mask and threatening them with a gun. Many of them were riding bikes when he approached them. Um, and in May of 2014, these boys, now men of the Painesville assaults, began to come forward and share their stories. Um, and it's just like it became very apparent over the decades that there was there had been a, a serial assaulter roaming the different uh, small towns of this part of Minnesota. And, right. um, and, and it was clearly this mm-hmm. guy was the one that took Jacob Wetterling. Um, and I think all of these, these guys that at teens were as teens were assaulted or trying to, to help paint a picture of what this guy was and maybe get him caught. And finally in 2015, police caught a break while searching the home of a man named Daniel Heinrich for a suspected child, child pornography. Um, Articles about Jacob's disappearance were found in his home and Heinrich's DNA would ultimately be matched to the case of another boy molested in nearby Cold Springs 10 months prior to Jacob. That was the case that we talked about earlier. Right. Um, He was a suspect in that at the time. He had been on police's radar from the jump because they knew that this guy was going around assaulting boys. Um, In 1990, police arrested him for related assault of a young boy named Jared, that one we talked about earlier in Cold Spring. Uh, right. But he was released and not charged, probably because Jared didn't stick around and testify against him, I'm guessing. And you can't blame him for that. Right. Around that same time, the Stearns County Sheriff of- Sheriff's Office and the FBI examined Heim- Heinrich's tires and tennis shoes to see if they matched tracks left at the Wetterling, Wetterling abduction site. 
Um, the FBI told investigators that the Sears SuperGuard response tires from Heinrich's Ford were consistent, but not an exact match to the tire tracks found at the Wetterling abduction site. And those tires that they were testing at the Wetterling abduction site might have just been that guy with the police scanner that was curious and drove out there that night and talked to police. Right. That might have just been him fucking everything up. That's what I mean by these guys that interject it themselves. It could have been anybody. It I mean, on a on yeah. a desolate rural road, True. it could have been anybody that had to pull over for a second, mm -hmm. you know. So I don't. It just could have been anybody, especially right there at the end of the driveway. It could have been somebody making a U turn, yeah, and they used the driveway as part of the U turn. So, yeah, yeah, those tires really fuck things up. Could have been a pizza delivery guy trying to find a fucking yeah. farmhouse in the middle of the dark somewhere, right? Uh, been anything, man. Investigators had been prompted by tips from the Painesville police chief and other. And, and another early suspect in the Wetterling case, they took a sample of his hair and searched his father's home at the time. They looked for incriminating fibers in his car and surveilled him. Even back in 1990, they were doing all this. That's how much of a target yeah. was on this guy early on. But ultimately, the police found nothing they could use to justify a charge in the Wetterling case. And this mm -hmm. guy was the guy. And we'll dive into a little bit about his background before we get to how he did what he did and got away with it for so long. So this, this bastard Heinrich was born in 1963 and grew up in Painesville where all those boys were assaulted. The Painesville assaults, it was him yeah. with the carpet mask it's and all of that. Town. It's where he grew up with his parents until they divorced and two brothers. Uh, he dropped out of high school and as a young man was arrested for drunk driving and burglary. He then joined the national guard in Minnesota in 1982 and was honorably discharged in the early 1990s. So of course, a stint in the military always, right? And mm -hmm. he claims to have had uh, head trauma as a child, as well as been, have been sexually assaulted. So he's checking some boxes here. Yes, he is. In the years leading up to his capture, he was still videotaping boys, delivering newspapers, and riding bikes and playing on playgrounds. So he was videotaping boys around the community, even up until he was like in his 60s. Yikes. How was he doing that in in the nineties. I mean, you would have to have like a big old freaking, <laughs> it's like nobody suspects the big old guy with the freaking camcorder. No, he was doing playground. this. He was doing that in the 2010s, like 2010 through oh. 2016, like still doing that shit. Oh, Oh, so who knows what kind All of right fancy then. camera he had at the time. Maybe he was oh, just yeah. doing it with an iPhone or something. Phone. Yeah. Yeah. So wow. they search his shit. And after being charged with child pornography and named as a per person of interest in the Wetterling case, Heinrich would ultimately confess finally after all those years to molesting and murdering jacob and agreed to tell police the location of his body in exchange for a plea deal it's a hell of a deal he made mm -hmm. so police would this is the most aggravating thing of the whole story right here yeah yeah his he, he didn't get charged with an he should have absolutely gotten never seen a light of day but i think it's actually possible that he could somehow that's terrifying. So police would uh, find and positively identify the remains of Jacob Wetterling on September 6, 2016, and declared the case closed. Heinrich would be found guilty of child pornography and placed in a Massachusetts federal prison on January 2017 to begin his 20-year sentence. So like I said, he could actually feasibly get out. I hope somebody kills him in there, man. Somebody probably will. Me too. You know, he's got 20 years in there for child pornography, and they know damn well. This crim them criminals know what the fuck. We, we, I mean, we'll, this is public information. We'll never, they got access to the internet. We'll never know how many boys he assaulted. It, it was a lot, probably a lot more than we think. We know he yeah. did quite a few and in you really think, and he was branching out into other rural communities nearby as well, and then, like targeting kids like Jacob and his friends. And, and you think Jacob was the only kid he killed? Come on. No, I don't. I, I just don't believe that at all, Lauren. No. He had other murder victims as well. Yeah. But just, just for the serial rapist alone, he should be in prison forever. Oh, 100%. And, and obviously for killing Jacob Wetterling. Well, of course. Yeah. I mean, but that he's not even getting charged with that. Right. It's mind-blowing. It's insane, man. So he would tell a federal, I think, you know, the Wetterling family wanted the remains back and all of that, and it had been 25 years since it happened, and it's like... You'll take what you can get at that point. He basically already got away with it, um, I guess. But he told a federal judge in a packed courtroom on September 6, 2016, that he was driving on a dead-end road near St. Joseph, so probably patrolling around, looking with his police scanner going, looking for any any young boys that were out and about in the dark. Oh, yeah. And he found himself to a dead-end road near St. Joseph near 27 years ago. Uh, and this was in 2016, that it was 27 years ago, by the way. So this is when he told the judge in that courtroom. Um, six years ago 
that he saw Jacob and two other boys on bikes with a flashlight that night. He said that he waited for them to come back. He saw that they went down this, this road and they were headed towards the store and he waited on that desolate road and waited for them to return. And when they did, he said he grabbed Jacob, put him, put him in his car and handcuffed him, drove him to an area near a gravel pit where he sexually assaulted him. There's the whole transcript. It goes into detail, graphic detail about the whole situation. But the gist of it is that they got back in the car after the assault and Jacob asked if he was going to take him home. And he said, no, this is the part that really gets me is Jacob started crying at that point. And at some point he pulls over, uh, gets out of the car. And supposedly he says he saw like a, a, a car, a police car go by with no lights or sirens going and it scared him. And that's what made him make the decision to kill Jacob is he was worried about being able to return him home. Cause the, basically the alarm had already been set off that Jacob would have been abducted and he was right. worried about having him in his, his custody. So he told Jacob to turn around so he could pee. And that's when he shot Jacob in the back of the head. Mm. He said that he, th this is what's crazy is what the way he went about this afterwards. So he shoots Jacob. He then, this happened like really close to his apartment in Painesville. This is where he had taken him to like a little desolate, spot by a gravel pit near like a construction site mm -hmm. near his apartment like walking distance so he does this he then goes back to his apartment then walks back over there and that's when he buries him but he was gonna he like went home to get a shovel and shit and realized it was too cold i mean it was october in minnesota so good luck breaking right. ground with Ground's a shovel and, and burying a body so he said yeah. that he knew that there was a nearby um construction yard and He'd been there, like he knew the area well. He lived in an apartment nearby and he walked over there and knew where the keys were to uh, like a bobcat. Fucking stole the bobcat, drove over, buried Jacob's body that night with the bobcat. What? Then drove some the, soprano shit. Yeah. Drove the bobcat back, went home to his apartment. And then a year later, you know, he returns to the site on foot again in the middle of the night from his apartment, walked over there again and saw that the body was mostly uh exposed like it had exposed yeah you could see his jacket see his whatnot. jacket he just like, basically oh collected like his skull and different bones and stuff and put them in a bag and then transferred them to once again another area nearby his apartment a farm where he buried them those items in a, a shallow grave where he would later like 26 years later uh bring police to for that plea deal and they would finally recover jacob's remains mm. And in court, he yeah, would show remorse saying, quote, I am truly sorry for my evil acts um, as he stood before a U.S. District Court judge and in front of Jacob's parents. And they were not so willing to forgive him. Patty Wetterling uh, told her son's killer that she won't waste a minute of time thinking about him from this day forward. And right a little on. bit more about Jacob from his cousin during they did another uh, basically like another funeral after finding his remains. So many years later, Jacob's cousin, Alan Overturf. Uh, remembered Jacob as a boy with twinkling eyes and a genuine smile. He said that Jacob loved the Minnesota Vikings and Denver Broncos and that he put peanut butter in his cereal and loved fishing. So just your you know, <laughs> average young boy with so much life ahead of him and this absolute monster right. um, took him way too soon. Uh, but there was some good that came from this afterwards. The Jacob Wetterling Resource Center, um, originally the Jacob Wetterling Foundation was founded by his parents in 1990 to educate the public on ways to prevent child abduction and molestation. The Jacob Wetterling Crimes Against Children and Sexual Assault Offender Registration Act was also passed in 1994 and was the first estab to establish mandatory state sex offender registries. The act paved the way for the more, re the more famous Megan's Law in 1996 and the Adam Walsh Child Protection and Safety Act of 2006. Mm. So um, what are, you know, Jacob's parents stayed, uh, continuing to try and prevent this from happening to other children over the years and kind of made it their life's mission as we've seen so many times before with parents of, uh, victims. Right. So, yep. I think Johnny Gosh's mom always comes to mind. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then, uh, the young girl, Amber, who the yep. Amber alert is named after mm -hmm. her mother comes to mind as well. Yep. Yeah, man, it's a sad one. Yeah, it's a sad one, guys. It's, you know, not yeah. a not a typical true crime guys episode. wasn't a lot of room for jokes in in this type of case. Right, but definitely one that needed to be covered. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, I'm surprised we haven't done this already. Honestly, I'm glad you I'm glad you chose it this week. Yeah, it was time to do it. 
it is definitely one that like i said it'll never leave me like this this whole imagery of jacob's abduction and murder like just putting yourself in his shoes and it's just like just the worst nightmare ever for a parent and for a child to go through absolutely yeah and like you said i hope it could literally happen anyone scumbag gets taken out in prison before he gets to see the light of day again or just dies in prison from cancer or something it, it just makes my stomach turn the fact that he could be out free again mm-hmm. oh 100 percent. Right? Yeah. god i mean he'll be old as shit but still i mean yeah just like you said so? like, to see the light of day again you just don't deserve it yeah no you're he a hazard to, to so many it wasn't just jacob he did this to so many other boys and like you said he was likely not his only murder he did it to 12 just in the town he was mm-hmm. from yeah in painesville in his own hometown painesville. yeah where he lived in an apartment right he, there 12 victims he was brazen enough to put to put jacob's body in walking distance from his apartment Jesus. so piece of shit man yeah but well there it is yeah but you know what's not shit oh my god i was trying to it find the a exact segue. opposite you. i couldn't <laughs> <laughs> it is the exact opposite yeah. as a matter of fact it's yeah. it's one of the greatest things you can put in your armpits no joke because Oh My Guy is an innovative, all-natural deodorant, fragrance, and beard oil company specializing in paraben and aluminum-free products. Their innovative line of deodorants inhibit the growth of odor-causing bacteria while still maintaining effectiveness. And at Oh My Gaia, they use only all-natural paraben and aluminum-free organic ingredients. And guys, for some reason, if you still haven't tried Oh My Gaia, try out True Crime Pine. That's our very own scent, our custom scent made from Wendy there at Oh My Gaia. Just for your true crime guys. That's right. And there's tons of other scents to choose from, like vanilla, cherry almond, sandalwood, lavender, lemongrass, Egyptian musk, uh, dreamsicle, leather, lumberjack, honeysuckle, fireside, bergamot amber, pear, sweet pea, sailor, barbershop, another one of my favorites. There's so many to choose from, guys, at shop underscore oh my Gaia on Instagram or ohmygaia.com. And because you are true crime guys listeners, you can use the word creeper for 15% off your order. That's creeper, C-R-E-E-P-E-R. For fifteen percent off your order. Again, that's at shop underscore oh my Gaia on Instagram or oh my Gaia dot com. O H M Y G A I A dot com. Do it now. Do it. Do it. Do it now. What else are you doing? <laughs> Who's your daddy and what does he do? Yeah. Uh, that's a flashback <laughs> to the nineties. The, the 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 soundboards. You remember you soundboards with uh, Arnold quotes yes. and things like that? You know, I used to prank call people. Yes, and I do. Those. So great. Yeah, I called this one. I, I, dude, I called this number, just a <laughs> random number one time. And this boy answered like, a, like probably like 10 year old kid or something. And I, yeah. I hit him with the uh, put your mother on the phone. And he goes, OK. And he goes and gets his mom <laughs> started. Hitting her. <laughs> it was the best. <laughs> oh, it was the best. what a rush, dude. <laughs> yeah, I remember those oh, soundboards. Yeah. They were like all types of diff- famous characters. And yeah. you could do cartoon characters. They're probably still available, shit, dude. You could probably still go find some soundboards somewhere online. Oh, yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. All right. Uh, let's talk about our other weekly sponsor. Uh, also, let's all natural, it. amazing company to, that you should support and use our code word for. That is Tonic CBD. It's true. Not all CBD products are created equal from how the hemp is grown and processed to how it's formulated and delivered into your body. Every step of the process that goes into making the product affects your ultimate experience with it. That's why Tonic's products really stand out. Founder Brittany Carbone created her own original formulas using CBD, adaptogens, herbs, and superfoods back in 2017, and has been working to deliver the most effective, intentional, and sustainable products possible since. Tonic Craft cultivates their own hemp on their certified organic farm in upstate New York. That hemp travels only 30 minutes to their state-of-the-art manufacturing and distribution facility where it's turned into a finished product and sent to you, ensuring only the highest quality vibes at every stage of the product process. They have different blends. Um, that you can try and find which one fits you best. And you can also verify the quality of their products by uh, tapping the top of their uh, packaging. They have a microchip in the packaging that uh, will link to your phone and show you third-party lab reports, product information, details about their farm, and even helpful blog posts to provide you with CBD education. So with uh, values rooted in quality, integrity, and sustainability, Tonic is committed to creating plant-based wellness products that are good for the people and good for the planet. Visit tonicvibes.com to learn more and use code creeper for 20% off your order. That's tonicvibes.com, code word creeper. All right. Right on, man. And if you haven't done so, obviously check out our Patreon page, patreon.com slash true crime guys. If you're a new listener, we have Patreon where there's like hundreds of episodes. Two bucks a month gets you in for all of the mm-hmm. once a month premium 
Patreon only episodes, five bucks a month gets you so much more, gets you everything. Every piece of content that we make on not only this show, yep. but every other show that we do between uh, Strange and Unexplained, Strange and Unexplained Stories, uh, The Five Minute Murder Show, uh, Just the Banter, which yep. we're about to record just after this, which is where me and Michael get together every week and just shoot the shit. We answer listener questions, just talk about what's going on in our lives, all of that. All of that's available that's right. on the five dollar tier uh, on Patreon. And then there's even the ten dollar tier, which gives you even more. But like go check it out, patreon.com slash true crime guys. I believe we have a, another Patreon exclusive episode coming up maybe next week. We never know, but we'll see. Uh, yeah, it's coming up pretty soon. Yeah. So well, all right, guys. That's pretty much it. That about does it. Right? I think so. That does it. it does. I mean, we did, we haven't done shout outs. If you want to do shout outs? Yeah, see if we you see if we got some. I have reviews. no idea where we left off, so you might get a double shout out. We'll see. No, that's fine. All right. Everybody likes shout outs, man. Yeah, we got, let's see, Freak369 uh, left five-star review. Fire emoji says, amazing podcast. Love their creepiness and their humor. Such great chemistry between the hosts. Keep up the good work. And they are in Switzerland. Thank you, Freak369 in Switzerland. Hmm. Then we got wow. uh, Tarassi in the U.S. says, this is such, oh, this is actually, no, this is for us. This is such a great podcast. Okay. I started with Sandu, but I ran out of episodes and came over here. I am not disappointed. Definitely in my top three podcasts. Keep it up. Uh, oh yeah! I want to say thanks to Sarah in Australia who said, "Well done, boys," and gave us five fire emojis. One of my favorite true crime podcasts, but gave us a two star review somehow for that. <laughs> <laughs> it was an Maybe accident. You screwed I'm up, sure. Sarah, can you go click five stars? Because yeah. if you if you love the show and you're dropping all these fire emojis <laughs> and saying we're one of your favorites, why'd you only give us two stars out of five? Damn phone. <laughs> uh, I'm not hating. It's all good, but it was probably just a mistake. Yeah. It's all good. We all make them right. Just crushes our average. No big deal. Yeah, no big deal. No. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you to everyone who takes the time All to go right, and guys. rate and review on iTunes or wherever you do that. Um, and if you cl- just go and click five stars on uh, Spotify, that's cool as well. We've got a few hundred of those. So yeah, right. thanks for all the support, man. We really appreciate it. And yeah, and also if you'd like to see the video version of this show, you can check it out on YouTube. Your YouTube go subscribe on YouTube. Absolutely. Yes. You can see my terrible yep. webcam, which makes me look like a ghost. It's awesome. I need to get a new one. <laughs> Go Don't sign up to Patreon order? so I can get a new webcam, guys. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Right on, guys. All right. Well, we'll see you next week, maybe, or it might be Patreon. I think it's probably Patreon. All right. We'll see you on Patreon next week. Sign up. You still got time. All Cheer. right. Keep creeping, Keep guys. Creeping. From the minds of true crime guys, come. TCG Weekly. If you've enjoyed this episode, please feel free to check out all the other programs on the TCG network. Every Wednesday, a new episode of True Crime Guys proper, Strange and Unexplained on Mondays, and Full House Fantasy Football on Fridays to start your weekend. And if those aren't enough, head on over to our Patreon account, where you can have access to hundreds of hours of content, including older episodes and other Patreon exclusives like Strange Shorts, Sandu Stories, Higher Thoughts, and the 5-Minute Murder Show. But until next time, guys, keep creeping. How do, you, how do you shut this thing off? Over? You hush your mouth, boy.